Hey, hello everyone. I'm City of Las Vegas Communications Director David Riggleman. Thanks for joining us for Access City Council. Coming up on this show, improvements to the East Las Vegas area continue with the opening of a newly renovated community center and sidewalks are being added to some of the older areas of town. We're going to talk about these topics and a whole lot more as the councilwoman who represents Ward 3, you know who it is, Livia Diaz. Welcome back. How are you? I'm doing great, David. How about yourself? <laughs> We're doing very well. Doing well. It's the nicest time of the year, we it were is. saying before we went on the air. So. Absolutely. The yeah. temperatures are pleasant. Um, we're getting all into the holiday exactly. festivities, we're which talk about that, are going to yeah. be so dangerous for my waistline. I could <laughs> yeah. already feel it. Yeah, mine too. The so. candy, the pie, the <laughs> everything, but it is what it is. Well, you only yeah. live once, That's right? right, exactly, exactly, good attitude. Well, you represent East Las Vegas, of course, Ward 3. Uh, for those of you who don't know exactly where Ward 3 is located, well, have no fear, we're gonna show you on the map. It's basically, again, the east side of our city, but it includes, it's, it's an interesting ward because it's not only East Las Vegas, but you've got some downtown, and you've even got a finger that extends west of I-15 now, so. Yeah, it's, it, so it covers that whole segment of the city of Las Vegas. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, I think one thing you're very excited about, we all are, one of the crown jewels of the ward is the East Las Vegas Community Center. And after a lot of renovation, it's reopened. <laughs> yes, super exciting that after 20 years of having the East Las Vegas Community Center serving our community, we gave it a much needed refresh. And so if you haven't been, I hope you can stop by. It got love inside and out. We've added a mural on the exterior. There will be murals, uh, two murals going in the interior. We also um, refreshed uh, all of those um, the art that was hanging out of the old DSC yeah um, now you will be able to see uh, it there, they, right there it there. is right there and, yeah. uh, it's just uh, I can't explain you have to go and experience your for yourself but it far surpassed um, the Ward 3 team's expectations of uh, you know making sure that we we're creating a space where, where people can come and you know, meet and have fun and create and, you know, just um, build memories for yeah. the years to come. And it's already getting plenty of use right out of the gate. So we have our seniors that I yeah. think, uh, you know, post pandemic are really craving uh, socializing again, having their groups and, uh, you know, making productive use of their time. And uh, so I just I am enamored with how uh, the you know, everything came out. So thank you to the contractors. Thank you to all the city of Las Vegas team. And obviously, uh, Letty Peters and her team will make sure to take yeah. care of our community as they come through the doors. And Councilwoman, I mean, you know it very well, but it's basically there at Eastern and Stewart. If, if you're trying to locate it right off 95, easy to get to and a uh, wonderful facility. It looks better than ever. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Um, gotten a lot of compliments <laughs> so far. And so just uh, come and enjoy. Come and enjoy. Check it out. It's our community center. Yeah. Congratulations, up and running. You got a lot of new things opening. Uh, you posted this on Facebook. You said, welcome to the neighborhood CCSD Family Support Center. And you'll have to tell everybody what this is all about. So this Family Support Center is across the way from uh, the new Global Community High School and the new Career and Technical Academy on Maryland and Oakey. And this support center is meant for parents of students who uh, maybe they're uh, needing ESL classes, adult ESL classes. Maybe they're needing other information. Maybe they're needing um, support for mental health for their kids. They're gonna be pretty much a wraparound center for parents and their needs. So I highly encourage parents to come by, check it out. It also has an amazing meeting space in there. Uh, there's a couple of modulars that also serve as classrooms. It's also maybe some digital literacy. Um, if you're needing anything in that continuum, stop by and let the fabulous folks out of um, CCSD know that are taking care of everyone there. Very exciting. Um, and I'm sure much needed. Yes, and it's a concept that isn't prevalent in very many school districts. And so I think um, they looked at a couple of models in other places like well, um, I think Massachusetts may have been one. I don't know if Dallas or Texas was another, but they really did wow. their due diligence and their homework on making sure that they brought everything in one space to help support our parents, support our kids. Because yeah. we know that as a parent, we don't always come, our kids don't come with a handbook. There's a lot of questions we have. And also to empower our parents to continue their trajectory of self-sufficiency or growth because there's never a bad time to learn more English or to get your high school equivalency or then put yourself on a pathway of a trade or a career that takes very 
you know, it takes some steps if you don't have um, the, the right uh, key to start the pathways, but I think that they're very um, interested in helping to support our community in those ways. Well, that's terrific. Well, you're helping in that area. You're also helping uh, with people's health. Uh, the Southern Nevada Health District opened a facility in East Las Vegas at uh, 2830 East Fremont, and this is great. This is. It's a federally qualified health center. Wow. That means that regardless of your um, health care situation, you will come here, be treated and seen, um, and they'll treat you um, and they'll provide services based on a sliding scale of your mm -hmm. income. So for a lot of our folks, sometimes they don't go to get preventative care, David, because they don't have the health insurance or it costs too much to be part of the health exchange. And so this is a perfect opportunity for folks in our community closer to us on the east side there on Fremont to go. And also they're going to be um, also, I think there is an office uh, for the health cards. Mm -hmm. um, so anytime you have to renew or get a health card, there's also an office adjacent there. So you don't have to make the trek all the way right. to Decatur and, Ma and Meadows That's right. Lane. You can go and um, take care really of, of your things yeah. right there. So check it out. Um, Go online, I think they have everything now, but if you're having difficulties, we've helped a constituent or two schedule um, a health card uh, you know, appointment. So you can always reach out to our office and we can help facilitate yeah. that kind of um, setting up an appointment for you. Perfect, and we should mention too, in your capacity as councilwoman, you also serve on the Southern Nevada Health District I Board. do, so it was a two for one. My yeah. heart is in making sure that there are no medical deserts anywhere, that we have equal access, and we know that sometimes transportation can be an issue, so let's bring it closer to you, but um, love sitting on the board and making sure that you know we're serving all of the public's need. Yeah. And you had a, a binational uh, health fair uh, week, health fair, part of that binational health fair, health week, mm -hmm. we had a health fair yes. on October 1st. Uh, yes. Tell us about this. On October 1st, we had um, at a Chuck Minker Sports Complex, this binational health fair that we've been doing with REACH, and REACH is um, working really hard with our community to connect those that sometimes don't have health insurance with a health care provider that can give them a pathway for treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had screenings for diabetes, blood pressure. Um, I think uh, we also saw lots of vaccinations, mm -hmm. not just COVID, but we also saw influenza That's vaccinations. Um, I think there were eye screenings. I know that um, I got my flu shot while I was there, and so did my husband and my son. So um, it was very convenient to, to be able to stop there and, and be seen. And Turo University was providing on the spot um, medical uh, just check-ins with people. And if people were needing uh, prescriptions, they were also being given prescriptions right then and there for, for them. So I thought that it was very, very productive. And I think we saw hundreds of folks, maybe even in the thousand range um, wow. of folks who came through that Great day. turnout, great turnout. And you didn't stop there either. No. Because <laughs> you also had a healthcare event. Uh, this was in partnership with the Mexican consulate here. Uh, this was, uh, and also joined with uh, Workforce Connections as well, right? So yes, um, we know that there are many moms and grandmas and aunts and uncles providing child care services to our community. And we wanted to give them an opportunity to learn about how they could be uh, um, an established or uh, legitimate child care provider. And so we had also um, a partnership with the state and the, the Department of Child Care Services for our, our state brought together um, a plethora of resources like Candelan, like the Urban League, um, who help, um, I think Wonder School is another one, who help child care providers like our moms and our grandmas and our aunts and teach them about how they can increase their business opportunities by having a license, also letting families know about the subsidies that exist for um, child care that a lot of families qualify for but don't know about. And then that in turn can help pay them, right? And they can receive the payment directly from the subsidy versus um, the parent. And so there's just a lot of interest uh, from this. It was a small group of 20 people, but all of them did this um, as a way uh, to live and to help support our working parents. And I think it's so important that we make sure that they're informed and they're um, able to grow their business. And there was already talk of an individual wanting to know 
up to how many kids they could take care of out of their home before they had to really go and grow their business into a child care facility. So super excited yeah, about that's great. continuing. The next step is um, a one-stop. There's a one-stop center of child care services that the state has, and we want to take them on a field trip so that they know where all the providers are. That's great. That, that, that's a, an, an excellent program. And then, uh, Councilwoman, I want to tell everybody we had a very special award ceremony that took place as part of Hispanic Heritage Month, kind of wrapping it all up. It took place here at City Hall. You were the host. Tell everyone about it. So we just wanted to recognize all of the hardworking folks that do so much for our community, that put on their heart and their soul because they really believe in the mission of helping to support each other, but yet uh, we wanted to make sure that they knew that they were recognized and valued members of our community and hopefully incentivize them to continue to do the good work. So we honored, uh, I believe it was eight or nine individuals mm -hmm. at this very first edition of Honor Awards. And um, I was just uh, pleased that everyone was happy. Um, it was a time to celebrate. Um, the many, many accomplishments of us as a collective group and helping our women with mental health, of helping those that are food insecure. Um, I'm trying to think, there was just so many categories. Also a young man who's uh, part of the swim team at UNLV was recognized as the outstanding athlete, uh, someone who helps our small businesses flourish and give them the tools. I mean, there were just so many uh, folks that help make Las Vegas better every day and I'm super excited that we were able to do this very first rendition of Honor Awards which is honoring our contributions and our roots and and you know not being shy about Latinos also add value to the fabric of our community right because we try to do good things yeah of course uh, and it was just the perfect way to wrap up uh, Hispanic Heritage Month too absolutely, I thought, as well. so, absolutely. And it, it, wonderful turnout for the first time out of the gate that was a great event with a lot of people showing up. That and we night. had yummy food from Leti's Cocina. <laughs> yes, we, did. we had amazing entertainment. I want to thank Ramiro Reyes and um, the the committee that he put together to help him head spear these efforts. I didn't select the honorees. It was actually a committee yeah, of folks that right, did that's so. Right. And so that. I'm super excited. They had the hard work because I'm sure everyone was worthy of receiving an award, but hopefully next year. Yeah, try again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And uh, Councilwoman, it's hard to believe that we were talking about this before we went on the air, but uh, you posted this on Facebook. Celebrate 20 years of First Friday tonight. And yes, First Friday celebrated its 20th anniversary. I remember the very first one, and it's come a long way. It has come a long way, and it's getting better and bigger and better. And um, I just want to thank Corey Fagan for her hand in this. And being the person who's the driving force and continuing to bring people downtown to enjoy and support the local art and artists that are here. You know, there are so many talented folks who sing, who paint, who just do other kinds of art. And um, I feel like this is a perfect opportunity to support our local yeah. folks. Um, and also for us to get out and see all of the amazing offerings that downtown has uh, for our community that hasn't been down here yeah, come check it in out. a while. Um, and so I'm just, uh, you know, I think also our small businesses are super, super pleased in the downtown area when this event happens because it brings my people to frequent their business and to know that they're there that they may have not known. Exactly. And that was the whole idea, I think, with First Friday back in the day was to encourage people to come and experience the area. There was a lot of uh, a lot of naysayers that said, oh, people never come down, it'll never make it. 20 years later, it's uh, it's going strong. Yeah, and we know that our downtown, you know, was a little rough yeah, in yeah. the beginning the when day, we set it, was, it up, but yeah. that's one thing that we've learned, David, that through activation, it really helps lift an exactly. area and it helps transform the area. And so the more we come together as a community and enjoy the open spaces that we have, the less of the other issues we face. So exactly it's right. so important that we be part of the solution. And you know, it's funny because that's now the hip, cool place to be. And you're right, 20 years ago, it was, it was a place maybe you didn't want to frequent. Yeah, but only only those eclectic, eccentric, <laughs> Artist uh, leaning folks would would you know dare uh, set foot down yeah, there, set right? Foot down there, but, but now, not now, yeah. Now it's somewhere where you can bring your kids and your family, and I hope everybody knows about the loop, 
where you can park in our city hall um, parking structure and it takes you down yeah. to that first Friday. And you park um, for free. And you park for free and you don't have to worry about, oh my car, don't ever park your car in an empty lot that is not paved, that is not marked, it's city owned. Uh, because that is not us. Right. Um, so just wanted to put a plug in because sometimes we get complaints about people being uh, taken advantage of. You're right. That, that's happened in the past at First Friday, but uh, we're making it so that it's not going to so happen take the anymore. Loop. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. And then, Councilwoman, this is great too. You posted this on Facebook. You said, don't miss our fabulous Pride Parade tonight. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, we celebrated Pride. It's hard to believe that. It was that, awesome uh, to be I know. there. I um, here again. And to be back in the parade uh, element, it was a very high energy parade with um, about 60 city employees who also joined yeah. us at Jason Big Red. And it was the first time I was able to ride Big Red in a minute because I know that it was undergoing some TLC and uh, I think they refurbished it and yeah. they made it pretty It's again. an old fire truck that we've... 1962 we, were, yeah. yes, we learned exactly, that night. Um, exactly. So it's a, it's a classic 60 now. 60 years old, yeah. But everyone was super excited, cheering and just having a, a good time supporting our LGBTQ plus community that night. Uh, wonderful turnout. Uh, people were saying it was the, the best turnout ever for the parade. Of yeah. course, we had a gorgeous night, too. That yeah. always helps as well. So I think uh, I think it's growing a crowd, hopefully. And I, I have some ideas to <laughs> bring up uh, Big Red a little bit. <laughs> uh, that's right. So stay tuned. It's going to be bigger and better next year yes. then. Well, Councilman, good job here. Uh, we need to take a short break, but when we return, find, about, find out about new efforts to beautify and improve East Las Vegas. That's next, so please stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. The city has long committed to improving East Las Vegas. This is an older area of town, and soon some of those neighborhoods will become more walkable than ever before. Plus, a whole lot more is coming. Here to tell us this is Mike Jansen, who is our Executive Director of Infrastructure for the City of Las Vegas. Mike, welcome. You are a busy man, and that makes Councilwoman happy because a lot of these projects are coming right into your ward, Councilwoman. Yeah. We're talking about new sidewalks in, a, in, in, a, in a, some of the older areas. Harris Avenue being improved, Eastern Avenue seeing some improvements. But I think, Mike, I think one of the things that people may not realize, and Councilwoman's certainly aware of this, back in the day when some of our older neighborhoods were built, sidewalks, believe it or not, were not required. That's correct, Dave, and uh, Councilwoman and I have had this conversation many times about how certain neighborhoods, uh, there's no sidewalks, there's no streetlights, and when we look into the records, we find that particularly some of these projects that we're advancing right now, where houses were built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, that just wasn't a standard back then. And so with these projects, we're going to be going in and uh, modernizing, if you will, the infrastructure, but really addressing infrastructure in an area where so many people walk to work, walk mm -hmm. to school, right. walk to the bus, and so the improvements are really going where they need to go and that Harris Avenue project I think is just the greatest example nowhere else in the city do we have three elementary schools within a one mile stretch it's a one mile long project from Bruce to just around Wardell okay. and three elementary schools and you want to talk about a lot of activity on those corridors yeah. where there's still missing sidewalks where there's still some missing improvements where some properties hadn't developed it's, a, it's going to be a great project for the school, and I know Councilwoman and I, we've talked about that project a lot. Probably more than Mike wants, <laughs> but, uh, but it was one of the things that as we canvassed our community, yeah. um, we noticed, and uh, the need is great there, and, and the folks have been bringing it to our attention, and I keep telling them, it's in the, it's in the pipeline, it's in the works, we're going to get there. And I'm just super excited that it's almost at the point where it's, the work is going to start transforming our communities for the better, to keep our pedestrians safe, yeah. uh, to make sure our kids don't have to walk on gravel or, you know, it's just gonna be uh, just uh, an added value added to sure. our communities. And, and then, you know, we don't just have youth also, we have the opposite end too, where we have a lot of seniors now because it is their forever home, especially with the housing market the way it is. They're not looking to leave anywhere on a fixed income. 
Um, and so that we also make, need to make sure that they're ADA compliant sidewalks in the community and that if that's going to be where our seniors are going to live, um, we need to make sure that yeah. also as uh, their mobility changes that the sidewalks are there to okay. help them. Sure, sure. So, and then Mike, the last project uh, is uh, about Eastern Avenue. Bus turnouts yeah. along Eastern are coming, right? Yeah, David, here's another great story. So a lot of times you drive around the city and depending on where you are, you'll see bus turnouts and then you'll drive in some of our older areas and you won't see a bus turnout. And we'll get asked, hey, how come there's no bus turnouts on street X, Y, or Z? Well, the fact is the RTC didn't start servicing transit until 1993. So there was no bus line on Eastern until 1993. In newer neighborhoods, when a developer comes in to develop, we require them to put in the bus turnout and construct it. But in our older neighborhoods, particularly wards one, three, and five, those are where we're doing retrofit projects, where we have to get right away from the property owners and have to negotiate how that process works, and then uh, find a location where they could fit in. So on Eastern Avenue, from Sahara to Owens, we're going to be putting in eight new bus yeah. turnouts that will also function as right turn lanes at some major intersections. So not only will it help with traffic congestion in the area, but what we'll hear a lot from some of the citizens waiting for a bus, particularly on a street like Eastern that's 45 miles per hour, is you know they're waiting on the sidewalk, yeah. cars are whizzing by. The beauty of the bus turnout is it pulls them back 10 to 15 feet from yeah. the roadway. They feel much more comfortable waiting for the bus. And so in partnership with the RTC, they'll have upgraded bus shelters, which are also lit. And it'll just be a great project for the Eastern Corridor. Wow. I used to take the bus. Yeah, I know. Um, to college, my very first year uh -huh. going to UNLV, yeah. I still didn't have a vehicle and I had to take the bus. So I, now that you bring the perspective about Bus is not running along Easter, and I'm like, wow, that was like three years in when I had to then make that trek and that commute to UNLV. And it is a very um, used bus line all up and oh, down sure. Eastern. So, so if for the safety of everyone and to improve traffic, that's going to be a godsend uh, for sure. For and sure. we're looking up, we're looking forward to the upgraded bus. Uh, shelters for yes. yeah. the commuters. Oh, exactly, especially during the, the hot months where you get that shade and then uh, even just to have a little bit of a barrier uh, in the winter months you know, keep the wind off you a little bit. The so. way we're able to do that is the old bus stops that you'll see, they're sort of a brown bus stop, uh, they were kind of squeezed into the right-of-way to fit in there, but with the new bus stops, new bus turnouts, we have a larger area to put in a much nicer shelter that provides better coverage from the sun, from the elements, and so overall, just for the transit rider, it'll be a great great project, but also the vehicles, because how many times have you gotten a call where someone says, oh, I got stuck behind the bus, yeah. I was trying to do, you know, trying <laughs> to go on a street, day, right, well, well right. the, the drivers love the bus turnouts as well, yeah, you know, sure. the motorists, so, so really it's a win-win for everyone. It is. Absolutely. Keep everyone safe, pedestrians, the bus uh, users, transit riders, and then also those behind the wheel. Yeah. Just, they so, keep going, the bus goes to the side. Exactly, nothing better. Uh, Mike, these are major projects. Uh, what's the time frame uh, for Councilwoman so, here? So, you know, what we always try to do is not have every street torn up at the same time. Thank we you. really try. <laughs> I know a lot of times folks will look and they'll see a lot of cones out, but we really try to stagger the project. So in this particular instance, the Harris Avenue project, that's going to start construction next month. It's going to be a 12 to 18 month project, dependent on some of the utilities. Uh, in order for us to put in the new improvements, the old overhead power lines have to be relocated uh -huh. by Nevada Energy. So there's some sequencing that has to be done, but Harris is going to be the first one where shovels will be in the ground next month, and then we'll be looking to bid and award the Eastern Avenue bus turnouts first quarter of next year. Okay. So probably this time, late next spring, next summer, Eastern Avenue will start on those bus turnouts. Okay. And then uh, we have another project, a smaller one, the Sidewalk Infill 2B. This is along a stretch of Stewart Avenue, uh, Cervantes Street, a couple of uh, little uh, streets that are uh, generally be between 15th and Eastern, mm -hmm. that's going to start in a couple of months as well. That'll be coming to City Council for a bid award. And that's also uh, houses that were built in the 40s and 50s that just back then didn't have sidewalk. Yeah. And so, again, we're coming in, we're modernizing the infrastructure and recognizing how valuable something like a sidewalk is going to be to the residents. 
And then there's one more sidewalk infill project coming, and, and that'll come, I guess, at the end of all this, Mike? Yeah, that's the real big, what we're calling uh, the sidewalk infill project. It's going to go from Maryland to Owens to Eastern, all wow. the way down to big, 515. Big area, yeah. And so when you look at that sector, what you'll find is all 40s, 50s, 60s housing, where there's still a lot of areas with missing sidewalks. There's areas that don't have ADA ramps. I know Councilwoman mentioned some of the seniors, a lot of seniors that use uh, a scooter or use a wheelchair. In some of the older areas where we don't have ADA ramps, they weren't required until the late 60s. This project's going to do all of that. It'll incorporate ADA ramps and then all those other street improvements. And so we're at 30% design right now. We probably got about 12 to 15 months of design work before we'll be in a position to get closer to bidding. So again, trying to stagger out the projects over the next one to three years so that the neighborhood doesn't see cones up and all the same time. That's important to know yeah. because so many people tell us in conversations they'd like to see the change we put it on our to-do list and it doesn't happen overnight so no. super important to highlight that it does take many many years from con conceptualizing it planning it and then being able to then get the shovels sure. on the ground um, the average because, time is what about yeah normally what we tell everyone is when we start a project we need at least 18 months to do the design work and then after the 18 months of design there's a three to four month process to go through the bidding mm -hmm. and award and then construction depending on the size of the project is anywhere from 12 to 24 months and that all includes having the funding in place so for these projects that we're talking about some of them are funding with RTC funds through gas tax and some sales tax allocations that the city gets and then others like the bus turnouts on Eastern we competitively are, are securing our federal funds that are specifically towards improving things like bus routes and so a lot of it is just having a team that is strategic in trying to get the funds in place right. but really it comes down to listening to the community listening to the council office to find out what is that priority because the truth is every part of the city there's a different type of project that's really important to that community and I think these ones that we went over today yeah. are just reflective of the priorities for that area of Ward 3. Mike, uh, touching on this will warm Councilwoman's heart. How much, uh, what, what's the investment that the city is putting in uh, to these, to these four projects. I think that's really the proof there is that the construction value of these four projects is about $27 million. That doesn't include- Way to go, Councilwoman. <laughs> doesn't include the engineering costs, the construction management costs, some of the right-of-way costs. All told, these four projects will probably end up being all in close to $40 million of wow. investment uh, into these areas. And uh, that's, really, that's really what's most important is I think that we're investing in our communities, our oldest communities and our newest communities we're trying to address that need from a transportation side of the house, and um, these are good projects for that I'm mode. I'm super excited also about the federal funds we got for our Stewart improvements, which yeah. we'll talk about when we're getting closer <laughs> to those. Mike is very creative at finding uh, finding those sources out I there. Love, I love my yeah. staff because <laughs> I tell them what we need, and they find a way to make it happen. That's excellent. So thank excellent. you so much, Mike, sure. for Mike, you and your yeah. entire team, like Joey Paskey and all of the folks. I mean, they're amazing. They are. They are a great team, and uh, great job, Mike. Thanks for the update. That's very exciting, Councilwoman. I know you're going to be smiling for, for days after this now. So. Will do. Absolutely. Uh, That's my on. trick or treat. There you go. <laughs> Oh, exactly, and Christmas and everything rolled yeah, into one all there. Into so, one. Exactly. Well, folks, we want to tell you, we always want to hear from you out there. So if you have something you'd like to share with Councilwoman Dees, you can find her on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also contact the Councilwoman by picking up the phone, 702-229-4623, or send her an email. Her address is odias at lasvegasnevada.gov. And cheer one of her great staff will get right back to you. So, Councilwoman, great job. We'll have you back in six weeks with another update from War 3. Mike, we'll have you back in the future. Maybe we'll get an update on how sure. all these projects are going. Happy so, to do it. Yeah, right, sounds good. Thank you both. We'll Thank see you, you next time. And uh, don't miss our next show beginning on November 3rd with Ward 2 City Councilwoman Victoria Seaman. You can now catch all of our KCLV shows on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. Also, watch for our QR code at the close of this show to subscribe to our newsletter. And don't forget... You can watch us live on the internet at kclv.tv. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you next time around.